is the Congress saying that India is not a nation. It's been, it's been since we are in the heat of a national election. The Congress party leader goes and says India is not a nation. It's some kind of a negotiation. And you may agree, disagree with the reference, but since Brexit... No, I strongly no, disagree. With that, with that. Politics or our... Would, would what, we, what do you mean they're going to put pressure? I mean, is that going to make a difference to our election results? It won't. I mean, do you think anybody in this country wants to be told by some foreign government as to what is right and what is wrong? Uh, I, you must be one of the few people who's read the Congress manifesto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how many people... I, I read, I read, man. I have even... Uh, I, I, but I, I compliment <laughs> you on your hard work. I would but even... I believe today, uh, as a foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister, yeah. that we should have a hard-headed view of our neighbours, especially of a neighbour like China. The point there, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, finally it is established that whenever a central force is weakened, the state is weakened. Mm -hmm. And one of the political issues which have been happening of late, Jay Shankar, anyone watching you closely sees that there's a fair level of authenticity with what you're mm -hmm. speaking. It's not a put on. Sure. But I have, I have I'm, I'm looking at it from that perspective. The Kachatibu issue will be seen to be one issue mm -hmm. in which the politics got ahead of the foreign policy. So when the Prime Minister says that the, that the previous government callously, Congress government callously gave away Kachatibu, and uh, then the follow-up question to that will be that when the third term of the Modi government starts, are you not going to take that through as a follow-through action or will you only say that they gave it away but because it becomes obligatory then for you to reopen no. the reopen the dialogue on Kachatibu no. with the Sri Lankan government, which no. will be a very tricky issue. Uh, no, no, I, I think the point is something else. Here we have had uh, for the last many decades uh, challenges, problems faced by Indian fishermen. Okay? Now you had the DMK posing as the champion of Tamil fishermen, saying they are in difficulties today because the central government took decisions which has put them uh, at, a, at a disadvantage or in difficulties. Okay. So a very clever political narrative has been constructed over many, many years where the DMK is uh, sort of fighting for the, uh, for the people who uh, who have a grievance and it looks as though the center is the culpable party. Now what the record actually showed was DMK was very much uh, party to, uh, to, the the, uh, to the decisions. Okay. And so uh, considering how much of an issue they had made this, you know, made it in parliament, made it a consultative committee, took it up in politics. You saw Anamale's interview, you know, how much yeah, yeah. Uh, Chief Minister was raising it. Chief Minister Stalin has himself written to me 21 times. 21 times raising issues of Tamil fishermen. So I think it was time that the public learned, saying, okay, yes, mm -hmm. we all recognize there's a problem. Now let's be honest. Who's responsible for it? Who was culpable? Who did it? and who went along with it. Agreed. And, and the real issue is, beginning from day one, they had mastered this practice of saying something in parliament <laughs> and saying that's something. A, that's the politicians are good at. No, 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 but this, but, kind, but I, I, okay, this I, kind of politics may, 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 should not may, be encouraged. May, may I intervene? Yeah, sure. I saw the papers and personally, I was appalled. I also saw the entire interaction that was going on uh, I don't know the exact date, between the then Foreign Secretary giving a briefing to Mr. Karunanidhi, I think it's 1974, yes, on what happens and he's laid it out. That this is the view of the central government, there could be Chinese influence, uh, we need to have a good relationship and hence we are taking this decision. To which Mr. Karunanidhi responds by saying that is there any other way but finally gets convinced and then says effectively that uh, I'll go along with you but I'll have to take a slightly low-key angle on this or a different angle in the in local politics. Because which, I have to help you manage it. Because I have to help you manage it. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's crazy that between the centre and the state then, DMK and Congress, they've come to an arrangement on the whole issue. You look, now, look, now. Now. Okay, you can say that is politics. My point is, having done that, now you are posing before the public and before the rest of the country as though you have nothing to do with it.
that's see this is the core point i i am again so in in this is at a time when after all, what what is an election about an election is about different political parties True. going to the people saying look uh, this is what we believe this is what we stand yeah. for uh, and we ask you for your trust and your support on that basis yeah so we think that is very important that party should come clean if they I, don't come I clean history totally, will come clean i, I am totally with you uh, totally and i agree with you on this now the question i am saying is that it's already if anybody says it it's already if anomaly says it the prime minister of india says it a follow up statement is made by the foreign minister of india then the sri lankan foreign ministry responds saying this issue is resolved 50 years back my specific question to you sir is can we now re we realize the issue of accountability hypocrisy giving it away duplicity of dmk congress etc understood can it really be opened up now can the modi 3.0 government no, no, look, reopen look, the dialogue look, on uh, can we make a claim on it uh, would that not worsen I, our relationship I, 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 no, where do I, we stand on i i think right now the important issue when people are going to polls is which party was honest which party is not which party is responsible for the situation in which the fishermen are fi finding themselves and which party by the way has been trying to uh, help i mean because i have also seen in this 10 years both as foreign secretary and as minister prime minister has himself repeatedly taken up the fishermen's issue with successive presidents and prime ministers of sri lanka yeah. so right now let's you know not jump the gun L right now we are dealing with an issue question number 2 is ca and uh, you know i am uh, i i really felt very strongly about the way there were attempts to polarize the muslim population or during the shaheen bag event and uh, you know uh, 2000 i think it was 2019 20 period in the intervening winter it was terrible i mean we we took a very strong line on it as a channel uh, we in fact support it but i am curious to know i'm going back to sri lanka again that during the sri lankan civil war there were some 10000 army troops we sent our army there to help uh, you know solve the city. long and short my question is that why would you know why would the ca really logically not apply to the tamil population in sri lanka because you will say there is already a treaty for tamil repatriation but then the same applies for everyone who does not come under the persecuted minority category in the case of tamils in sri lanka and that's a long question but um in the case of tamils in sri lanka the primary filter of persecution persecution is established and if ca is about persecution then why do the tamils of sri lanka no, not no. come under the ambit no i i think you are completely mixing up apples and oranges here uh, look the ca is derived from a certain period and a certain set of decisions in our history directly from the partition it deals with the aftermath of the partition okay, okay. what happened uh, in the aftermath of the partition was that uh, different post partition states yeah. were left with uh, with minorities mm -hmm. and it was the obligation of the states to look after the minorities okay and that was the basis for the nehru liaquat pact when the nehru liaquat pact was being concluded in fact there were wiser voices saner voices uh, which counseled saying look you are trusting a pakistani government which yes. already has a certain mindset a certain ideology a certain attitude uh, to behave like you are behaving and they will not do that okay that and and this is something which was very very uh, sharply repeatedly specifically particularly shama prasad mukherjee i think was was a mm. proponent of the view but he was not the only one lot of others held that view what we have seen after that has been actually uh, a treatment of minorities which caused them to look for safety elsewhere now in many cases if you look at the minorities concern where else will they go but go to india okay so that was the logic of the ca the sri lankan situation is very different because in the case of the sri lankan situation the issue pertained to the what were called the indian origin tamils mm -hmm. and those were negotiated uh, and uh, uh, settled through negotiations so 
I think you cannot compare what was happening in Sri Lanka with what was happening with Pakistan. I think they are totally different uh, situations. We are through CAA we are trying to do justice to a set of people who in a sense were caught on the wrong side of history who were let down by the assumptions of the then rulers of India that they will be looked after in the place Could of the Tamil. Could apply to the Tamil Hindus that they were no, left on the no, wrong side of no, history? No, no, again no. I think the, this analogy I, I think is not justified but is at there, all. But is there also not an assumption here that India is the natural home for Hindus? That is the argument that the BJP puts when we, when CA, see, see well, okay, so Mr. Jayshankar, may, may, let me just give me a moment on this. The position technically as government and foreign policy is one thing, but the position politically is that India is the natural home for Hindus and the BJP has made India the natural home for Hindus. Now, Maldives today, we all know the Islamist forces. I'm not talking Islamist politics which is going on there. It's a Muslim majority country with some 99.6% Muslims, but there is a 0.3%, 0.4% of Hindus. So if the question is that india is a natural home for hindus then should that should 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 that lever not be open for us that if hindus were to be persecuted and the politics were to be sharper in maldives we should bring them back equally equally allow me to complete we do hear of persecution and torture of uh, tamil hindus this has been a persistent political issue so why should they be excluded from the process no. why should partition define our present day politics no look partition does define our present day politics because it was such a fundamental uh, you can say mistake and whose consequences are still being felt today so let us not uh, wish away partition as just another event in our history it has had consequences those consequences today still continue to shape the politics and the foreign policy and the strategy uh, of the entire Indian subcontinent. So, so let's rec you know keep the centrality of partition very much uh, in view. Again, I put it to you: I do not agree with the implicit uh, suggestion so, mm, that no, somewhere you are you know uh, drawing an analogy between the situation in. Uh, in Pakistan and the situation in Sri Lanka. In the case of Sri Lanka, and on the contrary, it is our position that the Tamil minority in Sri Lanka should be uh, assured a life of dignity, or li you know, that they should be given equal rights. So on the contrary, it is not that we are encouraging Tamils in Sri Lanka to come to India. That has never been the policy, uh, nor in my mind would that be the right policy. So I, I do not accept the, the framework in which you are asking that question. So the West seems to have a very enthusiastic interest of late, Mr. Jaishankar, on the domestic politics, especially before the elections. And uh, we've seen this, some Australian channel running stories on the Indian Prime Minister accused of stifling dissent. Germany makes two statements regarding Kejriwal's arrest. Then the U.S. makes two statements, deep concern over Kejriwal's arrest, freezing of bank accounts of the Congress party. You are summoning the ambassadors, they are going back, but no reparative action. And to top it all, to top it all, the U.N. Secretary, the U.N. Uh, office also made the comment. So my question is, Mr. Jai Shankar, why is, I mean, I won't get into why this perception is there about India, because it's not perception. Is it the deep state getting back at India, especially because they are seeing Narendra Modi come in for a third term? They want to apply the pressure uh, and they're not being very friendly about it. And uh, is it the deep state getting back? Is this orchestrated? It can't be one off. It has to be within nations, five eyes, or something more deep than uh, what we. What? Uh -huh. it's, it's not accidental. I mean, it uh, doesn't. It doesn't appear accidental. I'm sure not to you either. Please. Look, uh, I would uh, use a different construct. Sure. Uh, uh, the construct I would use is uh, we live in an era of globalized ideologies. Okay. So what happens is people who espouse a certain line of thinking, let us say in India, hmm. would have counterparts or mirror images in other parts of the world. Hmm. And in today's politics all over the world, uh, these similar thinking people, you can say fellow travelers, support each other. Okay, when one is down, uh, uh, the other tries to tries to help out politically. Okay, this is this is by the way not necessarily with specific reference to uh, those uh, foreign ministry uh, remarks. I'm making it as a general point. 
so you see for example newspapers tv channels social media reports you know ratings of various kinds what what is this entire phenomenon this entire phenomenon is actually a globalized elite you can say who share a broad uh, similarity who have also that sense of entitlement that they run the world uh, and if any part of the world goes off in a different direction and their preferred choices uh, are not doing well hmm. then they try from outside to influence to legitimize delegitimize pressurize this this is broadly the form for the course you said uh, no this no. is the reality it's not part of the it's course not. because i'm going to challenge okay okay okay, okay. Uh, the uh, the uh, how do you how does one react to it okay hmm. you react to it at a political level by countering it by challenging it by putting alternative narratives in place by not turning the other cheek here hmm. not saying okay it's one very prestigious newspaper in america so therefore you know i must uh, uh, accept it or bend to it or hmm. uh, so if if it, you know uh, and and particularly you know we've seen this a lot of it out of new york and london i mean these are traditional anglosphere uh, hmm. uh, sort of hubs you hmm. can say so i think politically this needs to be countered alternative narratives need to be out there it has to be uh, clearly put that the kind of vote bank politics that they espouse the kind of special interest that they advance hmm. the fact that they they actually uh, on the ground you know while while preaching <coughs> a certain uh, 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 i would say a uh, a uh, vision of progress hmm. the reality is if you look at even the globalization vision that they espouse a narrow segment of people benefit and actually large masses get left out which is why there is today a global reaction to it and by the way we are today confident enough strong enough and independent minded enough that we will not be swayed by what you are saying so we it won't will, matter to us we will do our own thing uh, and we will counter it by our actions so will the pressure work so will uh, the pressure work So my first answer is my way of responding to 10 years of pressure one is by answering back but yes. the other is by doing things in india that when you have a government which says look this is a democracy that delivers we will use technology we will do good governance we will ensure that social socio economic benefits will be delivered on a mass scale and this will expose the people who espoused an earlier model which was actually I, uh, this is one way of doing it yeah. the other is when it comes to foreign officers mm. okay in diplomacy there is an etiquette okay i mean mm. people have manners nations should also have manners uh, sometimes people's manners are not good enough i'm afraid occasionally that is the case of nations too so when people with good manners countries with good manners are not expected to to uh, to comment on the internal politics of others because once you start doing it then what happens is you open it up you know uh, now this is not going to uh, help anybody at all so the point here is to tell such countries that look it's in your own interest please don't go down this path uh, that uh, and uh, also when they do it again don't turn the other cheek that to, uh, talk to, i mean as i tell people look if you comment on me I have the right to comment on your comment. Okay. Now, how I modulate it will depend on my strategy, my interest, my timing. So, so this is not an era anymore because again, part of it is it's not a level playing field. Okay. Hmm. The people commenting and the subjects of their comment were historically or at least in recent history not on par. So, hmm. some countries believe that over many years they've commented on the entire world and that gives them a continuing right to comment the world is changing you're going to get pushed back we are pushing back did america cross the line with the kejriwal comment no i I, the, i i i think uh, anup we as, made as as straightforward no, as you can I, tell no i think we made very clear what our view was that uh, you know i'm asking take, you did they cross no, the line i'm i'm saying we took very strong objection to what they did but it's different when an ngo says that it's different when a, when a, when a, but it is very different when a government says it why the government say it 
look we wouldn't take notice in the media if it was an ngo or a or a think tank saying it but if it's the government that says it it's a completely different matter which is why which is why we communicated very clearly to the american acting ambassador that we take a strong objection to what was said and that uh, what was happening in india was not a uh, concern uh, of any foreign government and that people should not why did they continue then why did they persistently continue to make the comments did I'm we not, uh, i'm not i cannot uh, anab either dissect it or justify it or analyze it beyond a point i mean if i feel what you have done is not correct why am i going into what could be your possible mindset that's for you to worry about so uh, part of last part of my question was that it's all happening together is it accidental that four or five governments are all saying the kind of same thing it's it, it's and it's official it's not coming from un germany uh, america you know i i, I don't is it accidental I, I is it coordinated i don't have a conspiracy view of the world but i do have a view that different uh, uh, countries different political interests different governments sometimes coordinate uh, that is a fact Will it affect the foreign policy of Modi 3.0? I don't think so. No, I don't think so, or it won't. No, I know absolutely. If all these countries were to put pressure, would it affect our domestic no, politics or our? Would, would what, we, what do you mean they're going to put pressure? I mean, is that going to make a difference to our election results? It won't. I mean, do you think anybody in this country wants to be told by some foreign government as to what is right and what is wrong? and if you look at these issues here is a bottom line you know there is a process of you know there are legal issues okay in these countries does the law stop an election starts so do they expect the law to stop in india yeah so look i i think let's not uh, overdo this i mean fine they said something we answered them back Uh, we've been very clear i mean nobody faults us for lack of clarity that much i can assure you and i think uh, uh, that's where it stays now if they if in their wisdom they choose to say something then in my wisdom i will also answer yeah and and what you say is very assuring very reassuring for a lot of our viewers uh, but mr jayshankar the way we are placed as a country as a as a global player hmm? things are going to dynamically change the prime minister speaks about viksit bharat and there's a genuine sense of excitement about it and i must say this uh, that that the way the, the the government handled ukraine was just i mean i've said it once he, the prime minister was at an event and i said that history will remember the way we did it but uh, you know the world will not want us to balance different boats and your answer to that maybe we are not balancing boats we are in our own boat but but i if i may go into a detail on this the messaging of in the ukraine foreign minister's holy video Uh, announcing his visit to india was not lost on anyone you know standing in front of the gandhi statue speaking at length on the values of gandhi making a very subtle nudge on the moral uh, you know the moral need for india to support uh, ukraine in the war against russia similar to the headlines uh, being made about india abstaining to vote on the gaza ceasefire uh, a few days ago uh, so there are undoubtedly lobbies and uh, lobbies putting pressure on india to take a stand uh, is it going to become increasingly difficult question 1 question 2 as we become more significant we become a 30 trillion dollar economy by 2047 it's a reality that coercion tactics pressure tactics you know all these things will increase on the country for people who are watching this interview in the context of the general election uh, they would want to know whether you whether you feel these pressures will increase in the future and therefore whether you feel whichever government comes into being or is in india over the next 5 10 15 20 years we'll have to take a little bit of a continuity route on our foreign policy uh you know uh, we all like to say this that foreign policy has a is largely an exercise of continuity like anything in life it's partly true and partly not Hmm. Uh, I can give you examples of continuity. I can give you examples of of sharp of differences. Sometimes sharp differences. I think today, if one looks at uh, our relationship with the U.S. or uh, our response to China, handling of Pakistan, uh, stance on West Asia, yeah. Israel, 
I would argue that a lot of these would have been different had uh, a BJP Sarkar under Narendra Modi not been in power. Okay. Uh, but having said that, your question, uh, so, so it does matter. It's mm. not like foreign policy runs on autopilot and doesn't matter what government comes. I think it matters very much course, what government course. comes. I mean, this government, for example, has a, uh, has a very uh, robust policy on counter-terrorism. It has a, a strong policy on defending our borders. It has a view about standing up to pressure. You yes. mentioned Ukraine. I yes. could give you Quad as another example. The pressure not to go ahead with what? So it does matter very much who is in power, who is the prime minister, what is the vision, what is the level of confidence. These things do matter. Your question, uh, will the pressures increase as we become bigger? Yes. Uh, you know, it's natural as any country rises, particularly a big country rises, uh, so, that uh, there will be others who will, in a sense, uh, uh, some will look askan, some would be uncomfortable, some would downright oppose. We are seeing shades of course, uh, shades of it. Uh, so a lot of diplomacy is going to be about how to manage that rise in the most smooth way possible. Now if you look at China's rise, China essentially rose, I would say, between about 1990s mm. till the early 2010s, the 20 years. Those 20 years, China had great stability in the international environment. You know, there were things happening, but those things were fireballed and put away on, a, on the side. It didn't affect mm. China. In our case, we have to be prepared to rise amidst a very volatile global situation. A lot of uncertainties, you know, the, where US will go, where China would go, what will happen with Russia, is your, Europe becoming more strategic, will the Middle East uh, kind of uh, explode even more. These are all going to be big issues. So we are actually looking at two, at a very interesting proposition. On the one hand, there is the rise of India. We have, you know, put our home, house in order. We are preparing ourselves for a, for a big move. Uh, on the other hand, when you look, there are headwinds. We have to have the experience, the confidence, the wisdom, the understanding to, to navigate uh, through those headwinds, which is why today it's so important to have a kind of leadership which the people of India will believe can sail the ship of India, navigate uh, through these uh, difficult waters. So it's a weaker, a weaker uh, central government in India works for India's global competitors, quite clearly. I mean, who would uh, not want to see well, us yes. face them? Yes. Uh, uh, to put it more directly, having Narendra Modi as Prime Minister of India is not in the interests of those who may be concerned that we will be outpacing them. Uh, let me put it to you positively. <laughs> I think Am I putting it? <laughs> no, I, I put it to you this way. <laughs> Having Narendra Modi as continue as the Prime Minister of India is obviously in the interest of India and the people of India. But I think it's also uh, very much in the interest of friends of India and those with whom we have converging interests. Because there are a lot of countries who today, they may differ with us, yes. uh, you know, uh, I mean, we discussed some of the Western countries, but by and large, Western countries today want to see India grow. They want to see India There are these strong lobbies and, you know, did you see the Guardian article? Uh, which I, featured I an article saying India... I don't India's normally read the Guardian. Is there a particular article? Uh, are you feigning ignorance of that? No, I, I, I don't normally I read the Guardian. I don't normally yeah. read the Guardian. But, yeah. but there was an article which caught my attention and I will, I, I'll, it's not about my views on it, I'd like your views on it. The, because the article which said India's foreign intelligence agency, referring to law, RAW, allegedly began to carry out assassinations abroad as part of an emboldened approach to national security after 2019. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, on the heels of this, another American paper, the Washington Post, I don't know if you read, says India was a miracle democracy, but it's time to downgrade its credentials. And, uh, you know, uh, in February, uh, a British uh, publication said India's civil society is under attack. Uh, the crackdown is heart-rending, hurting policy-making, millions of poor Indian lives. I wouldn't be concerned about the generic comments, but I am seeking your response to the very specific charge that we are carrying out assassinations abroad and uh, quoting Indian, unnamed Indian intelligence officials, etc. Look, uh, 
as a generic i mean no Specific i mean issues. no no on the on the first issue since you cited a lot yes if a bunch of western journalists have a problem with what is happening in india that's their problem okay i okay. we've been through that ground before uh, you know i mean i i brought out to you the biases the ideologies the condescension yes i mean the the old syndrome yes. Uh, syndrome yes. out there. so i i say i kind of Uh, we would uh, thank you very much i i know how good a democracy i am i am today a democracy that really delivers and if we start getting into merits of democracies and the qualities of democracies there may be a few home truths that i may have to give which you may not like but let's put that aside mm. the second uh, the issue uh, you know uh, if uh, in regard to uh, what you said uh, i think this pertain to pakistan so this pertained to the alleged assassinations in pakistan yeah oh no several so, individuals so let, many of no, them many of them Anna, were Anna, Anna. terrorists something allegedly happened in pakistan okay two people in pakistan presumably nationals of pakistan right that's what we are talking about yes then you have the wrong end of the stick here people should be asking pakistan who are these people who are the sterling citizens of yours who made such valuable contributions that their demise alleged or otherwise untimely or otherwise is a object of international attention so let's let's do some some digging out here who are these people you know why why are their alleged deaths causing uh, concern that should be the beginning no presumably but the question is the charge is being put increasingly of late that india has this mossad israel type approach where you enter the my 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 question is my question is still not being answered my question is if some some people allegedly died in pakistan for whatever the causes let's first discuss who are these people it's well known many of them are terrorists many of them are okay so let can i can i presume I, we did the background information we checked it i mean obviously the reference is to terrorists many of these terrorists are people who have played a role in carrying out terrorist okay. attacks in, in so, indian so so these some of them including these taking part alleged in these yeah. alleged deaths yes. uh, in pakistan of yes. certain people uh, uh, are uh, terrorists are terrorists well you remember that hillary hillary clinton bit about snakes in your backyard i think you have enough snakes in your backyard snakes may bite each other i mean i don't know i mean it's happening in pakistan it's for you know for them to figure out what is happening but i i would only say this the moment i see i see that word intelligence hmm. in any article hmm. i can tell you what every foreign office of the world will tell you no foreign office no foreign minister no foreign office spokesman ever comments on anything the moment you see that word intelligence we have nothing to why say. is that that is because no country does that no government does that so so are you saying that it has no credibility whatsoever that particular article i am not saying anything i am just saying that uh, there is a there is a uh, i mean a standard Uh, way by which every uh, government responds to anything to do no government responds to intelligence uh, speculation it it's it's i mean sure uh, let us say if this paper had made some article about british intelligence you think the british foreign secretary would be saying oh yes uh, come on guys let me tell you everything about this of course not Yes, no, but but in an election time, I'm seeing that as well as another article in the New York Times, which as says Modi is where demo global democracy dies. On 7th of April, a British paper, the Financial Times, comments on the 2024 election being the last democratic election in the country, and you're smiling. So, okay, so w- would it be that? you fail to convince the western media despite our stellar relationships with each of these countries on the robustness of indian democracy uh, and uh, how do you read this increasing frequency of these articles on the eve of what is seen to be a historic election in india i mean obviously uh, tell me one thing i mean you and i are sitting here in india a week away from the polls beginning do any of us actually feel that our electoral process our democracy is in any danger on the contrary what pick up today's newspaper what do you see you see leader a saying this leader b saying this opposition party somebody doing this deal somebody crossing over that side our democracy is in action 
No, they may be living, I mean, they must have some view of India on some other planet. But do you know, see, can, can you actually, do you think any Indian actually believes today that my, our democracy is not working? But do you not see a link between a Rahul Gandhi going abroad and saying the word? Democracy isn't just about an opposition party. It's about a set of institutions that support the opposition. And those institutions are either captured, certainly weren't playing the role that they're supposed to play. The entire opposition is struggling in India. Huge financial dominance, institutional capture. And so we decided to walk across the country. Western democracy should come and save us. And the comments coming so much so, and increasingly the State Department speaking up for them and the articles coming out. Do you not see a, a, a link between his appeal and their follow-up action? I, I do see, and I, yes, in fact, uh, early on began with that. I do see a global elite which often has preferences. When their preferences are not endorsed by an electorate, they apparently get upset about it. Mm. So these things do happen. And I also do see, by the way, I do see, uh, you know, uh, politicians from India and I, I have called it out before. Uh, you cited one example. Uh, that going abroad and inviting others to come and interfere in this country, which I believe is wrong. I mean, I may have my differences with you, but I don't think, I mean, look at our history. What happens when people go abroad and invite people yeah. to come? Yeah. Okay. I, I think this is... This is uh, it some, encourages that trend. You feel it encourages that trend? I, I think that's, that's bad for the country. It's bad for the politics. It's bad for them, by the way. My, my question to you is, we've seen what happened after the Pathan, uh, Pathan court, Balakot airstrikes. We've seen what we did with the Russian oil imports, how we took a position. But we've also seen, I mean, the word I would use is the pusillanimity of Indian foreign policy in the past. And I see this manifest, for example, in the Congress party manifesto, which says, straying from foreign policy, that the office of the National Security Council and the office of the NSA should be brought under the oversight of a select committee of parliament. So. One would argue then that would the National Security Council or Mr. Doval's office, which he holds today, come under the supervision of the Danishalis and the Mahua Maitras in the future? It's a very realistic question because it's been put up as a proposition. Whereas the world is getting specialized, domain experts. So uh, I asked myself, hey, were it not to be a straight election where we see a Modi victory, would it not be a matter of concern that the most populous country in the world would have its foreign policy turned on its head should the result be different? I think fortunately there won't be cause for concern. Oh, fortunately? This. Yes. So I think your worries are misplaced. This time? Uh, so, uh, no, I look, I am optimistic about our country. I, I, uh, I'm not saying we don't have challenges. But uh, since you mentioned some things, let me respond to it. First of all, uh, you know, uh, I, you must be one of the few people who's read the Congress manifesto. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how many. Places, I, I read, I read, man. I have even. Uh, I, I, but I, I compliment <laughs> you on your hard work. I would okay. even read the CPM yeah, manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I. But the the fact is that uh, if you look at most countries in the world, mm. uh, the the national security advisor in almost any country. I can't think of any country where they actually are treated as uh, as a, a part of a parliamentary oversight yes. uh, so so i think whoever wrote it i mean what can i say you, it won't have relevance uh, uh, so the uh, i mean in any case i mean i i admire the fact that you at least bothered to read the manifesto since there will not be an occasion for anything uh, practical to happen with that manifesto uh, this will remain an academic point but there is a larger issue that you have raised and the issue is this. You see, in the last 10 years, there have been some, uh, some significant changes in the manner in which uh, we conduct uh, foreign policy. Not just in policies themselves. I can give you, as I said, you uh, give me any major account and I will show you that there has been change and change for the better. But uh, if you look at some core issues, which I think today uh, worry should worry the Indian voter. Okay. One core issue you will agree, Anab, is terrorism. Yes. Okay. See now you have to look at the change uh, in in uh, you know what in the last uh, decade as opposed to the previous decade. 
and I take you back to actually 26-11. If you look, remember 26-11. You, if you see people, you know, accounts of 26-11, including by the NSA uh, of the previous government, you know, essentially 2611 happens, the best minds of the government apply themselves. There is, uh, you know, deep uh, uh, sort of consultation and confabulation. And then they collectively decide. What do they decide? To do nothing. So they go through this whole manthan and say, oh, by the way, the best policy is we should do nothing. What are you referring uh, to? 2611. Hmm. Specifically, okay. was there a policy note in which they ever said that? No, the, that we will do we, please read um, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon's uh, account of it. Yeah. So, my point is that if at the end of it all, because terrorism, you, you know, terrorism is not something which happened today, yesterday. Terrorism started in 1947, a few months after our independence. The first attack on Kashmir was a terrorist attack of tribal invaders on a non deniable on a deniable basis. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, instead of from day one calling out terrorism, fighting terrorism, what did we eventually do? We ended up on the conference table. No? And that's how you ended up with the ceasefire line. Now, my my point is that the way to fight ter today the people of India believe very deeply that there are some issues on which Government should take a strong, uncompromising stance. Similarly, but we I can't give you, take that for granted. We can't take it for we, granted. For, for sure. example, with China, we can't take it for granted. I, I agree with you on the terrorism issue, but thank you for complimenting me on reading the Congress manifesto, which also says that 370 will be brought back effectively. Mm -hmm. And my big concern is, since the election interview, Mr. Jayashankar, is that people are concerned. Okay, there is an assumption Mr. Modi will come back. But people are concerned, what if it, that were not to be the case? I mean, what would be our relationship with China? For example, for example, I am personally, uh, I mean, we saw what happened with Manipur. And there are issues of arms smuggling on the China-Myanmar border. We know the interest that China would have in destabilizing the situation in Manipur. And, uh, you know, China openly has declared its support for the junta in Manipur, no matter how the situation changes. So they are vested in, in Myanmar, I'm sorry, in Myanmar. So they are vested in Myanmar. They would want an entry into uh, into India. They would want to upset the domestic situation in India. There are lobbies here that have made things difficult for a reconciliation to happen in Manipur. Can we really assume that China would not, for example, look for a moment of weakness of India's internal domestic policy uh, and politics we, to get an entry? We point? must assume that life is competitive. There are powers who are, are competitive, yes. and the solution is to prepare, prepare and prepare. Okay. I, again, I'm sorry I'm going back into history, but sometimes history is a very useful uh, teacher. Take, take today one of the crucial issues with China, which is actually uh, the line of actual control and ensuring peace and tranquility there. What is it at the end of the day a function of? A crucial aspect of it is actually infrastructure. You know, when our problems with China started in the 1950s, yes. it was, it's very interesting if you go back. Where did it begin? I mean, there was of course a reading of China between Patel and Nehru. I've spoken about in public how Patel got it right and Nehru got it wrong. Okay. Patel basically said, we have a two-front situation. Nehru said, no, 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 you know, the, the Chinese will never do anything across the Himalayas. So, uh, Nehru was trusting, Patel was applying Politics 101 yeah. on a neighbor. He was just a sensible, practical, non-ideological person who made a good judgment. Okay. Whereas ne Nehru made a bad judgment because he allowed his ideology to cloud the basic uh, basics of, of uh, the situation. Yeah. Ba no, basics of diplomacy, yeah, yeah. which is you have a big neighbor, you have to take your precautions. Now, our first bad experience happened on an infrastructure. When they built the Xinjiang Tibet uh, highway, which went through the Indian territory of Aksai Chin. Okay. From day one, it should have been in our minds that if you need to deal with China, you must build up the infrastructure. Yet, what did we actually see? I mean, I'm now between 1957 58 till 62, 
okay infrastructure was and ak entry admitted it in parliament so we've had actually an enormous neglect i mean i'm giving you you know firm figures i mean if you look at the in the uh, the budget for uh, development of the infrastructure along the uh, ch- china border it has gone up from uh, below 4, about 3500 crores to about 15000 crores today if you look at the quality of projects the amount of road building going there the tunneling which is going there every day you will read about some project i mean prime minister recently inaugurated the sela uh, sela tunnel so my point is this look we have to assume arnab that competitive powers will do things they may or may not do it do not assume that they will not so i will assume that china will and in that context my very specific question is are you comfortable with the agreement signed between the congress party the mou signed between the congress party and the chinese government between signed by rahul gandhi in the presence of sonia gandhi in 2008 on the sidelines of the beijing olympics congress party has a side agreement with the chinese communist party how safe is that do you tell me it's not safe if you ask me sir do you agree with me look it's not safe uh, i it's I, not good i will only say this sir i believe today uh, as a foreign policy advisor to the prime minister yeah. that we should have a hard headed view of our neighbors especially of a neighbor like china that in that sense the patel tradition sure. rather than the nehru tradition should guide us you know it's not like we nobody wants bad relations with neighbors in the point there uh, mr jay shankar finally it is established that whenever a central force is weakened the state is weakened mm-hmm. and one of the political issues which have been happening of late is the congress saying that india is not a nation it's been it's been since we are in the heat of a national election the congress party leader goes and says india is not a nation it's some kind of a negotiation and you may agree or disagree with the reference but since brexit no i strongly no, disagree with that with that yeah. yes. would you like to respond to this view that india is not a nation the comment made everywhere it's a negotiation between states it's not really a nation in that sense can i get your thoughts on it i cannot believe that for any right thinking indian yeah india can be a negotiation how can it be a negotiation i mean this is this is our core core belief it's our it's our existence i mean how how can your core identity and your core commitment i mean a nation is what defines people every individual yes how can that ever be a negotiation 